And you asked me to talk about uh, advances in imaging in valvular heart disease. And if we look at the valvular heart disease, actually we tend to divide it according to the etiology or the type. And we have the primary valvular heart disease, the secondary valvular heart disease. They would be the main two different types. And in terms of uh, the global burden of valvular heart disease, if we look at calcific aortic stenosis, this is perhaps the most frequent valvular heart disease in uh, the Western countries, in the North Hemisphere, and followed with degenerative mitral valve disease. But if we go to other types of primary mitral, uh, um, primary valvular heart disease, we have rheumatic valvular heart disease, which is much more prevalent in the uh, South Hemisphere. And then we have endocarditis, which is much more rare and more anecdotal, and where we have uh, several registries, but um, um, these are very heterogeneous patients. In an international multicenter uh, registry with almost 1,000 patients, with 23% of them with discordant grading, so those with low flow and uh, low gradient, or normal flow and low gradient, and they could uh, propose the best cut of values to define severe aortic stenosis for men and women, which were quite similar to the ones of the study proposed by uh, Philippe Ibarro. And this uh, led to the algorithm that the European guidelines have, have in terms of how do we assess patients with severe aortic stenosis. This is kind of the last part of that algorithm. The first one is look at the valve. I think that we don't have to forget to look at the valve if that opens or not. And then uh, if um, the aortic valve area is uh, reduced, the uh, gradient is high, probably it's gonna be a severe aortic stenosis. If there is a low gradient, then you need to assess the ejection fraction. And if it's less than 50%, you go uh, to the vitamin stress echo and see whether there is flow reserve or not. And if there is no flow reserve, you can assess the calcium score by CT of the aortic valve. And if you have one of these cutoff values, probably that patient will have a severe aortic stenosis. If the patient has a preserved ejection fraction, those are patients that are difficult to uh, perform a dobutamine stress echo, and the guidelines do not specifically recommend that, but they uh, go with an integrated approach, also using the calcium score. Now, with the TAVI, many patients are going to have a CT for evaluation of the suitability for a TAVI. So, if you have a patient with probably a severe aortic stenosis, symptomatic, and is going to be for a TAVI, perform a CT, and then you have already this uh, value. Which are the trials that we have uh, in patients who are asymptomatic with preserved ejection fraction? In the case of severe aortic stenosis, which is the disease that leads the, the research. So we have the recovery trial and the avatar trial. And both of them included patients with severe aortic stenosis. Uh, the recovery trial, patients with more critical disease, perhaps, than the avatar trial. But both of them with uh, similar uh, primary endpoints with operative mortality and cardiovascular mortality. And both of them showed quite similar results. An earlier treatment, an earlier surgery, uh, leads to better outcomes than uh, having a conservative uh, treatment. Again, strain has been proposed as another technique better than ejection fraction to identify the patients that are at higher risk of uh, mortality in aortic regurgitation. And in primary mitral regurgitation, again, we focus on the ventricle. And particularly in this type of degenerative mitral regurgitation, there is one uh, disease that is associated with uh, ventricular arrhythmias and where the patients are at risk of uh, sudden cardiac death. This has been coming, for example, from uh, multicenter registries or one of the largest, for example, from Mayo Clinic as well, including 257 patients with ventricular tachycardia and only 70% uh, um, of them had moderate or severe mitral regurgitation. So there was 30% of them that didn't have mitral regurgitation, even though they had this uh, um, morphological or phenotype of Barlow disease. The question is, do we need to operate these patients even though the mitral valve is competent? And will the intervention reduce the risk of uh, ventricular tachycardia? These are questions that we don't know.
and what will be the future? So now that we have many uh, um, alternatives and we have good outcomes for uh, cardiac surgery with minimal invasive surgery, with robotic surgery, with transcatheter interventions, we want to uh, diagnose um, more patients. We think that there are still out there patients that do not receive even an echo. And we also need to know how we are going to follow the patients who have been diagnosed and do not have an indication for intervention. Do we follow them every six months? Or do we make a use of new technology that the patient can use and can gather those data so that we can learn from those data and have a remote monitoring and decide when is the timing that is ideal for the intervention? In terms of scalability and access to diagnosis, I think that uh, artificial intelligence techniques that uh, are applied to uh, POCUS echocardiography even can indicate which are the patients uh, based on these machine learning techniques that have a high risk of having a severe aortic stenosis and the patient can be referred to a center to have a proper echocardiography, a complete echocardiography, and have the first diagnosis. So this would be a solution in order to increase the access to diagnostic techniques.